This is the story of a journey in faith. It began with a colorful prayer service at Berlin's Brandenburg Gate. Once a symbol of divided Europe, the monument is now an icon of Germany's peaceful reunification. For Christians from Korea, a symbol of hope. We have seen in Berlin that the incredible can happen. Walls come down. Miracles are possible. Keep this hope alive in your hearts. May the peace train attract lots of attention and carry all people along the path of peace. In October last year, more than 100 Christians from all over the world boarded the peace train in Berlin. On the 11,000-kilometer journey to the World Council of Churches Assembly in South Korea, they would proclaim their hope that the two Koreas will one day be reunited. Berlin is the perfect setting. This is the place where unity became reality for the first time. It's the only city in the world that was once divided and then reunified. We had a piece of the wall at home, but I never realized its significance. I only really grasped that significance during the year I spent in South Korea. There are people there who still have brothers or sisters or parents in the north and haven't seen them for years, or perhaps haven't seen them at all. 29-year-old Daniel Jung was born in Germany and is studying theology here. But his parents are Korean, and the peace train means a lot to him. I can understand the Koreans longing for peace and justice. The feeling this evening is one of hope. But there's also the joy of taking part and having lots of time on the train to get to know the other passengers from 15 nations. When the Berlin Wall came down, we could only say, crazy. And that word occurs to me now. Crazy. It's amazing. Korea has been divided for more than 60 years, and the North and South are technically still at war. But the pilgrims on the peace train are convinced that it's not their dream of reunification that is crazy, but the walls and fences that separate people. Kwang Sam In is close to tears when she tells us that she hasn't seen her sisters for 60 years. When she fled to the south with her parents, her sisters remained in the north. They haven't seen each other since. It's very, very sad. I think of my relatives and my two sisters in North Korea. When my parents fled to the south, I was just a year old. I wasn't able to walk yet, and my mother carried me on her back. My sisters were four and six, and they stayed behind with my grandparents, who wanted to spend another night in the north before setting out on the journey. That was how we were separated forever. My parents didn't know then that the separation would be permanent. Nurse Kwang Sam In arrived in Germany in 1967 and is now retired. She wants to return to Korea on the peace train and hopes she'll be able to meet with her sisters again. But the border between North and South Korea is still as solid as the relics of the Berlin Wall. This section of the demilitarized zone separating the two Koreas is known as the Common Security Zone. The border runs directly through the Blue Barracks. This is the guardhouse where negotiations to end the hostilities took place between 1951 and 1953, and a ceasefire was finally signed. It's the only spot where the two Koreas come face to face. The peninsula is more rigidly divided than Germany ever was. Cross-border visits are seldom permitted. On a picture, they are crossing to north. <laughs> you know, South Korean government never you know, allowed to cross the 38 parallel freely. So now, looking at the picture on the 38 parallel, this is the 38 parallel on that. And the other side is North Koreans there, and then this side is South Korea. So they want just imitating to cross, but even the crossing on the picture. The peace train is set out to cross this very border. 
With their symbolic journey, the pilgrims are sending an appeal to both Korean governments, asking for reconciliation and peaceful reunification. But there are problems even before they leave Berlin. We've been stuck here at the station for two hours because we thought the train was leaving at nine. But that was wrong. Never mind, at least we haven't missed it. I like the way they're all sitting on the floor and chatting. Unfortunately, I can't get down that far. I'd never get up again. The atmosphere is wonderful. The boys have brought the provisions for the journey. They carried them here. Young people are wonderful. It's almost 10. The train should be leaving soon. I'm relieved that we're all here, that the food's arrived, and we're boarding the train in high spirits. Over the next three weeks, the pilgrims will cross seven countries on their 11,000 kilometer journey. That includes North Korea, a Stalinist-style dictatorship hostile to religion. The peace train's ultimate destination is Busan in South Korea, venue of the World Council of Churches Global Assembly 2013. The journey is an inspiring gesture. But as the young pilgrims discover, peace has to be negotiated, even in everyday life. The is done. He sleeps here, and then he sleeps on top, and I... <laughs> <laughs> and it apparently doesn't get any easier the older you get. The pilgrimage leaders have precisely the same difficulty deciding who should sleep where. But negotiation is the key to overcoming this impasse as well. The goodwill with which the pilgrims resolve their disputes is itself a lesson to the countries through which they will pass. We have to climb all the way up there? Just imagine. On the second day of its long journey, the peace train passes through Poland and Belarus. A plane from Germany to South Korea only takes about 13 hours. But the tempo of this train ride is a fitting symbol of the patience that reunification will require. Deacon Rainer Lamotte explains. The slow speed is appropriate. We have to cross a number of borders. I haven't counted them, but we'll be traveling through six or seven countries. If we succeed, we'll be crossing from China into North Korea, and then from North Korea into South Korea. That's all very symbolic. I used to share a flat with two Korean women, who both spoke very good English. Of course, you learn a bit of Korean that way. We'll be arriving in about 50 minutes. We'll use the time to tidy the compartment as much as possible and pack our things. Let's hope we don't forget anything on the train. At the end of the first stage of its journey, the peace train arrives in Moscow. The Kremlin, viewed from the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. This is the Church of the Patriarch, head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Destroyed in 1931 during the Stalin era, the cathedral was reconstructed as a perfect replica at the start of the new millennium. The Russian constitution guarantees freedom of religion, and the pilgrims are given a friendly reception. There is interest in the peace train and the question of Korean reunification. I feel that I profited from this exchange of views. It was an opportunity to get to know some people better. The impression given was that Russia is very peaceful today, acting as a mediator in Northeast Asia. I wish it could. From Moscow, the pilgrims continue their journey on the Trans-Siberian Railway. The stretch from the Russian capital to Irkutsk on Lake Baikal is the longest stage of their trip, four days and four nights without stopping. I ask myself how I'll survive the third day on this train. I really don't know. The trip from Berlin to Moscow was good. But now we have to cover a greater distance, and that will be a problem. For a start, it's much too hot on the train. We dressed warmly, and now we're much too hot. 
But on the entire journey, I've seen people smiling and laughing. That's wonderful. Time for just one more photo, a souvenir of their brief stop in Moscow. Bye bye, Moscow. Bye bye, Moscow. happen today is we will start with this marvelous book here entitled Peace on the Korean Peninsula. Try to at least get a little bit to know about Korean Peninsula issues. The pilgrims hold workshops on the train. They learn how Korea was divided at the end of the Second World War. The Communist North attacked South Korea in 1950, which triggered the Korean War and ultimately the division of the peninsula. Despite North Korea's claims to be democratic, it is a brutal dictatorship, one of the most oppressive regimes in the world. Breakfast is simple, just porridge and buttered bread. The Trans-Siberian trains are hardly luxurious, but hot tea from the samovar is something to savor. Oh, mm. <laughs> We're doing okay. Our space is two meters by one and a half meters. That's not bad. It's enough for a long trip about the size of the old jail cells. The service is excellent. And the best thing for me as a Russian language teacher is that I can chat with the staff on the train. It's Sunday and time for a prayer service. Pilgrims of the peace train, let's join this time of worship to sing together and worship the Lord together. Then get ready. Join us. Methodists from Korea, Mennonites from India, and Lutherans from Germany singing and praying together. Church unity in practice. So that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Amen. I've never experienced a church service like this. The microphone and amplifier in the corridor were new to me. It's quite a cacophony with the train clattering on the tracks and us singing and praying in all sorts of languages. I have the feeling that we've grown together. At events like this prayer service, you can see that we're united in our aim. This is a pilgrimage, even if we aren't traveling on foot, like pilgrims on the road to Santiago de Compostela. We have all the inconveniences that a train like this involves, small compartments, sitting and sleeping uncomfortably. Some of us would have liked to have taken a shower this morning, not to be squeaky clean when we approach God, but simply to feel a bit more comfortable. But we bore the deprivation with dignity. At sunset, the train reaches the taiga, the great Russian forests. The pilgrims are almost halfway to their destination. Yekaterinburg, the main industrial center in the Urals. It's cold here, and the pilgrims warm themselves by singing. Our hope is the reunification of Korea. The song has become the anthem of the peace train. We've been told that we've just crossed from Europe into Asia, so we're celebrating. We've completed the first stage. The train ride was pretty tough. Not much space, but most of us coped very well. Everybody's glad to leave the train and get a bit of fresh air. <laughs> With each new day, the excitement increases. Will the train be allowed to pass through North Korea? 
So far, there is no official word. I'm collecting signatures to petition the authorities. The assistant travel leader is doing his best. Yesterday, uh, the representatives of uh, both uh, uh, South and North Korea's uh, churches, uh, they met uh, in China. And then we are seeking for a possibility to get uh, from Beijing to uh, Pyongyang by airplane. I thought we had a 20% chance of being able to enter North Korea, but now they tell me it's 50-50. I'm confident that we'll be allowed to enter North Korea. They said uh, uh, in two or three days uh, reply for confirmation and uh, we are uh, expecting to say yes. God is guiding us. Evidently, the application for the permit is being considered at the highest level. Kwang Sam hopes that the peace train will soon be making history. Never before has such a large Christian delegation been allowed to enter North Korea. The wind off Lake Baikal in southern Siberia gives the pilgrims fresh encouragement. The wind of change, a symbol of their dreams of political change. The peace train project was beset with difficulties from the start. But now that the pilgrims have covered half the journey, their hopes of achieving their goal are growing. Officially, both North and South Korea are committed to striving for reunification. But in the past half century, they've grown farther and farther apart. Passing through the Gobi Desert in southern Mongolia, The oldest pilgrim, 77-year-old Sukya Chung, also sees this as a powerful symbol. This train should go through the desert. Then we, we will give up everything. Then we will not have this kind of imperialistic idea to go into North Korea. Both people have nothing to desire, but really become in one. The pilgrims have grown closer on the journey. There's a general sense of contentment here. We've been on the train for two weeks. I'm surprised by how happy I am and that I'm not tired by the group. For a person as large as I am, it's difficult when someone takes your seat or you continually have to push, it's tough. Of course, traveling in a large group is tiring. I thought that I would have the feeling I needed some privacy after about a week, that I needed to retreat into my own space, but that hasn't happened at all. Meeting all these people is really great, and I can't even imagine what kind of influence it can have on the political level. North and South Koreans ought to make a journey like this together. Beijing marks a decisive moment in the journey. Here the pilgrims hope to receive their permit to travel through North Korea. If not, they'll have to go around the north by boat. Has their petition been successful? Us or uh, the South Korean delegate, they will make uh, their answer by 21st, today. Still no official answers. Uh, all right, current situation is seemingly is almost uh, impossible. 
They haven't been refused entry yet, but they haven't received the longed-for permit either. Kwang Sam's chances of seeing her sisters look pretty slim. I think she thought of it as her last chance to see them again, in life. Very much disappointed, but huh? that is a reality, merely reality. In the past few days, our hopes have been raised and dashed. We wrote a letter, and we all signed it, and sent it off. And then we were told that both political sides were indicating that it might work out after all. But now it's looking bad. Tomorrow we'll do it another way, and then the day after tomorrow. That's part of the conflict. A decision has been reached. The pilgrims may not fly to North Korea. The train should proceed to the North Korean border. Here we are back on the train. We're traveling in the right direction, but unfortunately we have to leave the train before the border. Not being able to enter North Korea should make us work even harder for reunification. The Chinese port of Dandong presses up against North Korea's western border. With a population of two and a half million, it's an important commercial hub. There's nowhere along the border where you can get closer to North Korean territory. The Yalu River is all that separates the two communist states. Here, the Friendship Bridge links Dandong in China with the North Korean city of Sinyuyu. Originally, there was also a footbridge, but it's been partly demolished from the Korean side. However, trains still regularly cross the bridge. We had to stop here because of this political reason. I want to cry now. I would really like to board the train and go to my sisters. I could also scream and try to make myself understood and call out to my sisters. Han Yukom was just a baby when her parents fled with her to the south. They crossed the Imjin, Korea's seventh largest river. The people helping us to escape were frightened, since we were surrounded by North Korean soldiers. If I had started screaming, our lives would have been in danger. So my father said if I screamed, he would throw me into the river to save the many refugees. My mother said, how could you do that to a living creature? Then she climbed out of the boat with me and walked upstream through the night. It was midwinter. At a place where the river was shallow, she waded through the river with me on her back. I long for the day when we can cross the Yalu River without restrictions, or the engine, where, with me on her back, my mother stared death in the face. Our boat follows the river for kilometers, and we don't see any wall or fence keeping North Koreans away from the border. But there are underground bunkers, manned by soldiers every 200 meters or so. We see run-down factories, people struggling to grow corn on the bare hills, while stones on the mountain slope proclaim in large letters, Long live Kim Jong-il. I'd like to know what the people are thinking. I'm sure they're thinking they'd like to go to China, to South Korea. They definitely want to be able to travel. And I'd like to take them in my arms and travel with them. My sisters have no idea that we are so close on the Chinese side, on a ship. I'd really like to swim over to my sisters, to where they're living. Finally, the pilgrims take a ferry across the Yellow Sea, from which they can view North Korea from a distance. In South Korea, the train is waiting to take them to Busan. Tomorrow is the opening of the World Council of Churches Assembly. Welcome in Busan! Yep, at last we arrived in Busan. We have made it through. In Busan. The peace train pilgrims are given a warm welcome in Busan. This is incredible, the number of people. 
I'm completely overwhelmed and happy. A weight off your shoulders? Absolutely. Here at the opening service of the World Council of Churches in Busan, the hope is strong that one day Korea will be reunited and that peace and justice will prevail.